Hello, Eddie. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for joining me for today's uh, COVID-19 update. I'm pleased to be joined by uh, Secretary Jose Romero, uh, Secretary uh, Johnny Key of Department of Education, and we've got uh, Secretary Solomon Graves here at the Department of Corrections to give an update as well. So we've got a full schedule today, but let me start by addressing uh, the fact that uh, Representative Dan Sullivan and a few other legislators have filed a lawsuit challenging uh, the executive authority to deal with the current emergency that we have. And I think it goes without saying that this is really not an attack on the Department of Health, but it is an attack on the broad executive authority that I as governor have acted under during this emergency. And uh, this uh, actions that I have taken during the emergency is based upon what has been approved by the Arkansas General Assembly uh, that gives the authority for a governor, a chief executive, to manage an emergency and to act quickly because it is that type of urgent situation. At least seven of the legislators that are named in the suit were on the Legislative Council at the time the rule was approved, which allows the Department of Health to issue the directives that are in question today. And so that was in December of 2018, and the legislature wisely approved those rules that gives uh, authority to the Department of Health and the executive branch to act during uh, this emergency. The argument of the legislators is that they consider the Department of Health guidelines and directives as rules that the General Assembly should review, should change, should rewrite, should allow or disallow. And I don't know of, even though my great respect for members of the General Assembly, and they bring a great deal of expertise, I don't know any of them who are as qualified in public health matters as our epidemiologists and our public health leaders at the Department of Health. Regardless of that, that is responsibility has been assigned to them, and under the legislator's argument, the General Assembly would be deciding what the public health guidelines should be for the Salt Bowl at War Memorial Stadium. Uh, they would be deciding and debating uh, what kind of guidelines should be in place and directives be in place to have uh, audience at uh, uh, Razorback Stadium uh, or Arkansas State University or they would be debating whether we should have the chuck wagon races in Clinton because those are based upon public health guidelines. Directives and guidelines that is assigned to uh, the Department of Health. And so that is not how to act quickly during an emergency. Those are executive branch functions that are based upon the authority wisely granted by the General Assembly. Uh, now, I, as governor, am accountable to the people of Arkansas. I'm elected by the people of Arkansas, and the decisions I make are accountable to them. That's a democracy and our uh, representative government in action. But when people are dying, you don't need delay. You need quick action. There is a national emergency, and 50 states have declared an emergency. President Trump has declared a national emergency and we are acting based upon the authority that the legislators have given to me. Now, I am delighted that the majority of legislators understand how this works and understand uh, the necessity of executive action during a pandemic. But the legislators have power to end the emergency if they chose to do so. They could do it by concurrent resolution, which means they can call a meeting of the of the two bodies and by concurrent resolution, uh, they uh, can uh, end the emergency and they can take action. Now, if they did end the emergency, that means a lot of things goes away that are based upon actions that I have taken. Uh, if the emergency ends, then so does telemedicine. If the emergency ends, the liability protection for small businesses would end. If the emergency ends, the suspension of rules to allow virtual education as an option uh, would be curtailed. And all kinds of other things from e-notary to uh, the sign-in of wills during a pandemic, and including uh, we would have to end the rapid 
licensure of medical personnel that have been critical during these times. These are examples of executive action that's been taken that has been necessary uh, during this pandemic. There is a small group of legislators who I respect that have filed this lawsuit, but uh, I believe it, the fact that they have not taken steps to end the emergency under their power, uh, it is broadly supported by the vast majority of legislators and I'm grateful uh, for their support. I do believe it is important that Representative Dan Sullivan and the, minor the minority group of legislators that have filed this lawsuit, uh, they are raising money, they're raising money as uh, official acts as public officials, elected officials, and they should disclose each and every donor that has contributed uh, to the filing of this lawsuit. I believe that would be appropriate. It indicates transparency. They're elected officials, and if anybody is trying to gain influence uh, through this, uh, then that, that should be disclosed, and I believe that that is important. Uh, with that, uh, I know that's in the hands of the judiciary now. Uh, but I wanted to make those comments since that law lawsuit has now been filed. I also wanted to mention that yesterday we did receive a letter from the CDC, uh, Dr. Redfield, indicating that uh, there could be a vaccine that is available uh, even as early as November 1. Uh, I have reviewed that letter. Uh, the letter asked us to expedite uh, the uh, development of uh, uh, facilities as needed for the storage of the vaccine, uh, but uh, Dr. Romero is intimately engaged in uh, that review as being on a key committee, chairman of the committee uh, that reviews that, and we have to have more information before we can actually start uh, building or knowing what type of facilities are needed. We have to know more about the uh, requirements of the particular vaccine but we stand ready to help and to facilitate and expedite uh, when we get uh, more direction as to what is specifically needed uh, from the state in terms of the uh, vaccine. Now let me uh, go to the uh, case report, and I think the case report today does indicate we continue to be in an emergency. Today we have an additional 969 cases. Uh, that gives us 63,081 cumulative cases in Arkansas. We do have a decline, which I'm grateful for, of hospitalizations. We have a minus 10, so it's down to 425. And we have 20 additional deaths here in Arkansas that Dr. Romero will uh, talk about in more depth, uh, which brings us to 861 Arkansans who have died as a result of COVID-19. Uh, testing was a very good testing day with 7,827 tests that were completed in the last 24 hours. Uh, and while Dr. Romero will give us the uh, number of counties that uh, had more than 20 cases, I wanted to mention the top county first, and that is Washington County. Of the 969 new cases, Washington County had 211. Now, obviously, in Washington County, we have the University of Arkansas and 81% of those new cases were between the ages of 18 and 24. And so I think it can safely be surmised that many of those new cases are uh, college students. And uh, it's just a signal that we have a lot of work to do here in Arkansas, that the virus is still out in our community in various ways, and we have to uh, protect each other. We have to follow these guidelines and uh, I want to urge all of the college students, as we go into the Labor Day weekend, I understand many will probably not be going home uh, since they just got on campus, so they'll be around and they'll have some free time. And you've got to be cautious over this weekend because 900 cases can be 1,500 cases. 211 cases in Washington County could become 500 cases in Washington County. So we need, and it's not just Washington County, there's Jefferson County, there's Craighead County. We need all of our, our college age kids to take this more seriously than the average college student takes uh, a pandemic. And uh, we ask you to make sure you protect others over the course of the weekend so we can continue and to have the kind of school year we all expect. Uh, with that, uh, let's go to uh, the uh, graphs. And we can see uh, the uh, high number of cases, uh, which is 
getting, it's not past the top, the largest day, but it is certainly a high day that we've had. Uh, let's go to the next one. You see the rolling average it has an uptick today. Uh, hopefully that rolling average will not go up. Uh, the next one is the number of hospitalized, and uh, we see it dip down a little bit, which is encouraging to us. Uh, we'll see where it goes from here, uh, but we don't want to get to the high number we had before. On the active cases, uh, we're not near the level that we have been when we had over 7,000, but we do have over 5,000 active cases. Uh, this is the antigen test, and this is what I indicated we are going to be doing. And so we've had a cumulative number of 1,123 antigen tests, uh, which means it is growing because that's one-tenth of how many I want uh, all month. Uh, so I'm encouraged by that number. Uh, in the antigen test uh, for the last 24 hours, we've had 533 antigen tests. Of those, 59 were positive. Uh, that gives us 11.1% positivity rate for our antigen test. Uh, and then we can see the uh, positivity rate, which I just talked about for our antigen test. Uh, you can see that just a little bit over 10%. And this is the uh, PCR test in Arkansas. Uh, and this is the way we're going to show it, antigen test, PCR test. They're all cases uh, the, uh, that we're uh, reflecting. but we still want to be able to uh, separate those test results and our uh, seven day rolling average of positivity is down, but that's gonna be backfilled. So I really look back more on the, uh, back in this time frame to see where we are uh, because that has already been backfilled. So we will wait to see what that trend is. And then uh, this just shows that we had a good day uh, in our testing with our commercial labs and with our Department of Health. And I think that's, uh, uh, and back on the antigen testing, uh, no, the one we had. This is showing what's gonna be on the website today, uh, right here. Uh, this is gonna be on the website and this is how it's gonna be the antigen testing volume and percent positivity uh, that will have uh, it broken down for the longer time period and then the most current time period uh, and then the total number of confirmed and probable cases uh, the cumulative number will be reflected there as well which are the confirmed cases and then the probable cases which are the uh, from the antigen test so that will be available uh, for the website and this is what you'll see when you go to the website if you want the covid uh, status updates check that and you'll be able to get that information. And then finally, uh, before I turn it over to Dr. Romero, it is significant to note that while we are uh, challenged in higher education, in K through 12, if you look at where we started schools and the number of positive cases in the schools versus where we are now after the completion of a week and a half, almost two weeks, uh, we're only up one additional positive case in our K through 12. And so Secretary Key, uh, all the administrators, teachers, the students, they're really doing a good job out there and those are encouraging numbers. Uh, with that, uh, uh, Dr. Romero. Thank you, Governor. So um, continuing with the numbers, total number of Cases in Arkansas to date are 63,081. Um, as mentioned by the governor, um, we had 20 additional deaths uh, added to the rolls yesterday for 861 cases. Um, this is uh, uh, due in part to, to a cluster of uh, deaths that occurred um, in um, Mississippi County. Uh, eight of the nine deaths uh, in nursing homes occurred there. Um, we have only a single delayed uh, report. Um, the testing has been mentioned. Uh, just let me mention that uh, in addition to that, that the Arkansas Department of Health uh, contributed to the total 2,374 uh, tests performed. Uh, there was a significant uptick in the commercial and private laboratory um, of testing of 5,082, and a University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences contributed 300 
and 71. There were eight counties uh, that had uh, 20 or more cases in them. The governor has mentioned uh, Washington as being the top county uh, with a significant increase to 211 uh, cases. Um, and as mentioned, 81% um, of those uh, cases came from the age group between 18 and 24 years of age. Um, Pulaski County also suffered an increase um, of uh, 90 cases. Benton, 47 cases was number three. Jefferson County increased uh, to uh, 38. Important to note again that uh, uh, the colleges are contributing uh, significantly to that number. 50%, approximately 50% of that increase uh, was due to uh, it, uh, individuals tested between the ages of 18 and 24. Uh, number five was Sebastian at 36, um, followed by Celine, Celine at 33, Faulkner at 27, and Craighead um, at 25. Um, when, uh, one more um, piece of information. In comparing the start of college to where we are today, we've had a significant increase again in that, nu in that number of individuals. So 250 new cases among the college uh, age group. So uh, the colleges, are, uh, universities are driving this forward. So um, I think that uh, my message for today is that um, really, again, directed towards the college and university students. Um, we uh, are seeing significant numbers of cases from uh, those institutions. Um, they are the reflection of um, uh, a less than rigorous uh, adherence to uh, the recommendations that have been made over and over again, and I will repeat them, I'm sorry, uh, to using your face mask, um, social distancing, hand washing. Um, as, we, as I mentioned yesterday, I understand and we all know that college is a time to socialize, but we need to do this in a very, you need to do this in a very responsible manner. And as the governor mentioned, we're coming up on a, on a major holiday. This will give uh, the college students uh, a lot of free time. Um, and as mentioned, many are not gonna be going home. So I cannot stress enough the importance of this because this will increase significantly more if it's not brought under control now. So with that, I'll uh, end and uh, turn the podium back over to the governor. Thank you, sir. Secretary Graves. Excuse me, Secretary Graves. Thank you, Governor, uh, for your continued leadership during this pandemic and for your support of the um, announcements that I will be uh, making in short order. Um, First, I think it uh, would be helpful to provide a case count for the Department of Corrections. Uh, as of this morning, our current case count is 432, uh, with our largest cluster of cases being at the following three units, the Varner unit in Lincoln County uh, with 190 active cases, 81 cases at the Wrightsville unit in Pulaski County, and 53 cases at the Benton Work Release Center in Saline County. The first announcement that I wanna make this afternoon is that beginning next Tuesday, the Division of Correction will receive, will resume the intake of male inmates to our Washita River Correctional Unit in Malvern. Washita River serves as the intake unit for male inmates coming into the system. Uh, Intake has been suspended since June when we had the initial outbreak at the Washita River unit and given their sustained uh, su success and um, the recovery of the positive inmates we have there, we are at a point where we can move forward with intake. Uh, we will begin bringing in inmates in, group of, in groups of 50. This uh, number will allow us to cohort new, uh, new intakes together. Uh, for the duration of their initial quarantine period and will also support our ability to uh, test those inmates and further isolate should a uh, positive case be identified before those inmates are transferred to their unit of assignment. As of this morning, there are currently 1,484 male inmates uh, backed up in the county jails and we understand that um, this does place a real burden on our partners in the local law enforcement community as they themselves continue to grab, grapple with the impact of COVID and their need to create space within their county jails. The next uh, announcement I wanna make is that uh, through a partnership with the Department of Corrections, WellPath LLC, which is our contract medical provider and the Department of Health, 
uh, we have uh, built a, a live interface between the Department of Health's uh, laboratory management system and the offender record system utilized by the Department of Corrections here in the state of Arkansas. This interface will allow us to electronically process laboratory results for the first time during this pandemic. Since the beginning of this pandemic, we have been manually processing lab results, which have often uh, required our medical staff to work most evenings and weekends to process those lab results as quick as possible. In fact, uh, the lab results for a single patient were touched at least four times from start to finish before those lab results were considered to be fully processed by our contract medical provider. So that, it, um, that development is an exciting, exciting enhancement for us internally and is reflective of some of the successes we have been able to realize uh, through Governor Hutchinson's transformation efforts since July 1. Finally, I want to announce that beginning uh, next month, we will implement a phased reopening of in-person visitation at state prisons and, correction, and community correction centers here in Arkansas. This phased reopening of in-person visitation uh, will be informed by the uh, case, case counts at the uh, individual prisons and community correction centers and also reflect the uh, medical opinions of WellPath LLC and the Department of Health. Uh, the uh, specific elements of our in-person uh, visitation will be developed and finalized uh, during the remainder of this month but will likely include some of the following. Uh, COVID symptom screenings for all visitors, the identification of uh, high-risk visitors, reduced visitation numbers, staggered visitation dates and times to allow for uh, distancing of visitors at our facilities, and obviously the uh, utilization of face coverings while in our facilities, along with the um, expansion of non-contact visitation throughout our correctional facilities. Go, Governor, thank you. Governor, thank you for acknowledging the hard work of our school administrators and teachers, uh, students and the parents. Uh, support staff. Uh, they have done a great job as we near the end of the second week of school. Uh, today I want to report uh, there are two additional uh, districts that have made modifications uh, to their instruction. Jacksonville North Pulaski uh, at Jacksonville Middle School. Uh, they are moving to virtual for tomorrow, Friday, uh, 9-4, and then are evaluating for uh, what happens next week after they come back from Labor Day. Uh, but again, this is primarily due to the number of uh, staff that may have, uh, uh, that have to be quarantined. Uh, Earl Elementary School uh, with Earl School District, uh, they've had a situation where 50% of the staff at their elementary school uh, have had to be quarantined, uh, and they are moving to virtual for uh, the period from September 3rd through the 17th. Um, and it, it, it's worthy to point out that over the last two weeks, we've had more students that have been impacted uh, with weather issues uh, than actually being out due to COVID. So um, it just goes to show that the work that our districts have done to prepare for uh, pivoting to virtual instruction has uh, uh, been very important for other reasons besides the pandemic. Uh, so uh, they are, again, to be commended for their hard work. Thank you, Johnny. With that, we'll take any questions. You've said over the past couple of days several times, college students, please be responsible. Take this seriously. What will you do if you see that they do not listen to you? Well, can, well we will take the steps that are necessary in conjunction with the uh, institution of higher education. There's a lot of tools that they have uh, to encourage good behavior or to uh, take steps if there's a congregate facility that's a particular problem. Uh, so they are policing themselves. Uh, whenever you have 24,000 students at one institution and tens of thousands at others, uh, that's a lot to manage. And the biggest challenge again is what happens off campus uh, over the holiday, over the Labor Day weekend. And that's where 
Uh, it's not just what happens on campus, but happens off campus, and there's really nothing to be done about that except individual students uh, that make the right decisions. And so we're trying to, as Dr. Fauci said, uh, you know, this weekend's gonna determine a lot. We looked at, you know, Memorial weekend, you look at the July 4th weekend, which was not near as bad, but what will Labor Day weekend be like two weeks from now in terms of cases? That's in the hands of those students, and we're asking them to do, uh, act responsibly. Uh, speaking of Dr. Fauci, I saw he listed Arkansas as being one of the states that's at risk for a significant surge in cases. Would you agree with that? Or? Uh, yes, uh, I agree with that. Uh, I uh, think it uh, acknowledges that uh, we have had uh, cases that have not skyrocketed in terms of the peak, but when it, he pointed out that if you have a increased positivity rate, that's a sign that you're headed in the wrong direction in trouble. Now, uh, if you look at Washington County, you've got an increased positivity rate. Uh, statewide, we're still in the safer zone in positivity rate. We're actually out of red and in yellow under the White House guidelines. So uh, I think it was simply a warning for him. He's not saying it's gonna happen. He's saying pay attention. And so that's the same message that we're trying to reinforce here in Arkansas. This is a very critical time this weekend. It's a critical time as to whether we go flat, whether we go down, or whether we're gonna wind up going up because of increased activity and uh, uh, not following the guidelines. And so uh, I'm glad he sounded that warning. Uh, we're seconding that warning today. Does the 50% of staff at that rural school having to quarantine, does that indicate a lack of social distancing in that school? From the information we have, uh, that appears to be connected with off, out of school socialization. It does not appear to be connected with uh, any type of in-school operations. Is there any uh, question remotely? Yeah, uh, Governor, uh, this is uh, Andrew with AP. Uh, I had a couple questions. Uh, going back to uh, this, the CDC letter that uh, the state had received, are you concerned at all about the uh, about the timeline of this uh, and the possibility of this being motivated more uh, more by politics, get, given that the, the timing of this uh, being right before the election? And uh, and also want to see if Dr. Romero had any concerns about that as well in terms of the, the timing. And going back to uh, U of A and the cases there is. Is there any kind of mixed message that's being sent to college students? That, you know, we keep keep hearing that they need to avoid parties, they need to avoid uh, crowds, and uh, use self discipline. But we still have the bars open open up there. Uh, is is that a mixed message at all? And are you are you open to the idea of clo closing bars or even looking at something targeted just to just to Fayetteville in that area? Uh, that's a good question, and uh, let me address both of those, and I'll ask Dr. Romero to talk further about uh, the CDC letter. Uh, the letter came from Dr. Redfield. I've visited with Dr. Redfield on a number of occasions. He's been uh, the utmost professional. Uh, he values uh, his public health responsibility, and I have full confidence that uh, whenever he says, uh, let's get ready, we need to get ready. Uh, so I, I take that at face value, and in terms of timing, uh, to me, the quicker the better. Uh, America wants a vaccine. We want, uh, obviously, to have this uh, approved through uh, FDA approval process. Uh, you've got FDA looking at it, you've got CDC, uh, but uh, they're, they're proceeding methodically. I mean, the fact that other nations have accelerated and, and already indicate that they have vaccines out there uh, indicates that our time frame is not bad. We have a more rigorous review process. So I have uh, confidence in uh, the CDC, Dr. Redfield, and their communication to us. In terms of the University of Arkansas uh, or any college campus, uh, no, I don't believe that's a mixed message, but it is a broad responsibility that a number of people can address. Uh, for example, 
uh, you know, we're saying that our restaurants are open, uh, that we have bars that uh, are open as well, but there are strict guidelines in place. We're not allowing uh, massive crowds in which they're mixing up. Uh, there's requirements in place that they have to socially distance, and if they're not drinking a beverage, uh, they have to have a mask on. Uh, the staff has to do that. We have our ABC enforcement out there to enforce that. And so I am calling on all of our establishment owners to help us. Uh, you, it's in your interest to make sure that our students uh, are encouraged to do the right thing and that you're, you set the right example. Uh, and thus far, uh, they've worked very, very hard at that. This weekend is a little bit more severe test. Uh, with that, uh, Dr. Romero. So I'll, I will limit my comments to uh, the issue of safety of vaccine. Um, we have throughout the process in which these vaccines have been brought forward through the testing process been reassured by the FDA that there will be no um, uh, uh, lessening of the stringency for safety of these vaccines. Um, both the uh, VRPAC, which is the uh, body that advises the FDA on, on uh, licensure of vaccines, and the body called the ACIP, um, which uh, determines how to use the vaccine, are clearly looking at the issue of safety. Um, so all groups have focused on the issue of safety in addition to efficacy. But safety is paramount for this, and I think that all groups will not um, uh, turn a blind eye if safety issues are, uh, are, 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 are come to the fore. So thank you very much. Uh, next. Hi, Governor Hutchinson. This is Emma Claybrook with 4029 News. I have another question about the U of A. Um, do the numbers in Washington County at the U of A make you reconsider supporting football with fans at the stadium? And at what point is that number of cases at the U of A putting our Kansans in, community, in the community at risk? Well, they're not at risk if they follow the guidelines. And that's what is, uh, uh, to me, very important that if we're gonna have economic activity, if we're gonna have even social activity, sports activities, we have guidelines in place that are designed, if they're followed, to protect the public health. And so that's what our concentration is. In reference to you know, the athletic program and sports in the future, uh, you know, it's my understanding that there has not been any outbreak or even positive cases among the uh, athletic community there. They're really taking this seriously and doing what's necessary. And whenever you're looking at Razorback Stadium, uh, you, you know, the uh, attendance has strict requirements in place, not just wearing of mask, but the fans also have to socially distance. Uh, so those limitations in place are designed to allow a limited activity in terms of audience uh, under safe conditions. Uh, we'll always continue to evaluate it, but that's where we are right now. Hi, Governor. It's Neil Gladner in Hot Springs. Back on the CDC letter, in some news coverage this morning, some governors have talked about expenses that will be associated with that. Do you have a handle on that and if you'll be able to use CARES money for that if there are expenses? And the second one, if, if you mentioned Dr. Romero, chairman of one of the committees, could he maybe kind of give us a little bit more detail on his involvement in that from a medical standpoint? Uh, sure, and in terms of the uh, finances for it, it's really difficult to determine. We don't have enough information. Uh, they simply said, uh, uh, you know, you might have to help uh, the distribution in terms of, of the building of facilities. I don't even know if that's necessary. Uh, because we already have a distribution network. I think the biggest question is the storage and how we are going to store that if the vaccines have particular storage requirements. But we don't have those details yet, so it's hard to know the investment. But uh, we, including the General Assembly, wisely reserved $250 million of our CARES Act funding so that we would be prepared for vaccine distribution. So we have our money set aside for that purpose from an extent standpoint. And uh, uh, so I, I, I think the biggest thing, we need more information before we know exactly the next step we need to take.
So if I understand the question correctly, it is what is my involvement with one of the two committees that I mentioned? Um, so and, uh, and what the committee does. Yes, sir. Uh, so um, I am the chairman of the advisory committee on immunization practices. Um, it is the uh, committee that uh, determines the use of vaccines after they have been licensed. That is, it determines which groups um, uh, are the most appropriate to receive vaccines. We're uh, comprised of non-governmental uh, voting members. Uh, there's 15 of us from different areas involved in vaccinology. Um, I've been on the committee and now for six years going into my seventh year, uh, four years as a, as a regular voting member, three years as a, a chairman, and uh, uh, two years as vice chairman. Um, uh, it's the only non-governmental agency that makes, if you will, or issues recommendations for policy. Our recommendations go to the director of the CDC, who then um, either approves of them or uh, rejects them, and they are published in the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. Uh, once they are reported, once they are reported or published in them, then they, the, the vaccine uh, cost is covered by uh, various agencies and insurance companies. So it's an important uh, agency for the, the, the distribution, uh, sorry, for the um, uh, identification of which populations are important to receive a uh, vaccine. Thank you. We're fortunate to have our Secretary of Health on that key national committee. So thank you for your leadership on that. Next question. Uh, are there other colleges where this is uh, a problem? Uh, we've had uh, a number of cases at UAPB, and the Department of Health has uh, uh, enhanced their testing availability and special testing events there at uh, UAPB. Uh, so uh, that's how they're addressing that. And you've got to remember back uh, whenever we had in Northwest Arkansas other uh, outbreaks uh, in the Marshallese population in uh, the poultry industry. We really got in there and identified the cases and did our contact tracing, and we got that under control. Uh, it took us a while, but we got that under control. So, you know, even though we're having this spike of cases, the design is that we get in there, we isolate, we do our contact tracing, and, you know, we avoid the spread uh, of that, uh, even in that uh, uh, higher education community. So, uh, uh, we've got our resources in place. Uh, but we want to make sure that the other institutions are covered as well, and, and uh, those are the two that I would mention. All right, yes, final question. Is there anything you can tell us about this cluster of deaths in the Mississippi County nursing home? What could have contributed to this cluster or the disease getting into the nursing home? Uh, we don't have any more details on that uh, other than it was uh, that number in that particular uh, setting. With that, uh, thank you for your attention today. Tomorrow, uh, by the way, uh, we'll be in White County. Uh, we'll be doing the uh, broadcast from Searcy. Uh, give us an opportunity to uh, see that community, listen to them, and to give our report statewide. Thank you.